Good afternoon, Megan. How are you today? Hi, I'm good, Mal. How are you? Good, good. I understand you just came back from a business trip. How did that go? Yes, I did. I was in Toronto this week um, for executive briefings with some of my largest firms, and it went great. Hadn't been to Toronto since I was 10 years old, so it was really nice to travel for work. There's no uh, you know, substitute for the face-to-face -face interaction, so it was awesome. I, I totally appreciate where you're coming from. I, I used to be in sales as well, and doing it over the phone or via Zoom is just not the same. So you yeah. have a much better relationship when you are face-to-face. Uh, -face. Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, thank you for being here today and taking the time to be uh, interviewed for the Women in Tech and their Money Stories series. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we were just discussing that we met five years ago at uh, the Professional Women's Club of Chicago and Gosh, a lot has changed between since we met and where we are now. And also yeah. just realized that we're both Penn State alumni, which, yay, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Nanny Lions. Yep, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So I am living in River North, and I have been at my current company for, oh my goodness, it's been four months now. I actually just joined Latera in June as a senior account executive and legal technology consultant. And that was coming off of four years at Thomson Reuters, um, where I did similar type of work, um, wasn't so much on the tech side as much. But uh, prior to that, I was practicing law in Chicago. I have been in Chicago for 13 years, so I consider myself a true Chicagoan. I'm not from here, though. I am originally from Syracuse, New York, which is where I grew up, and then, of course, went to Penn State. Um, but came out here 13 years ago and just absolutely loved Chicago and live here with my husband and uh, my dog, Blue, who's a beagle. And nice. Wonderful, nice. So. I've been here about the same amount of time, too, and I agree. This is definitely home. I can't imagine living anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great city. And the first thing that I noticed when I came out from New York was just, you know, I, the people are just so nice and I just had such, uh, such a good energy, such a good connection. So. Absolutely. Well, so a lot has happened in the last five years. Tell me a little bit about your career journey and what's been going on with you. A lot has happened. I definitely, uh, definitely am in a much different place than when I first met you. And I consider myself very, very lucky to kind of had, have had the evolution uh, in my career that I did. When I met you back in 2017, I was practicing law and I had only practiced for a couple of years. I actually started in family law. Um, I was clerking in a family law firm when I was in law school. And they ended up offering me a position, um, which I was very grateful for. And, um, you know, I think that I knew pretty early on in my practicing law career that it wasn't really where I saw myself for the long term. But the issue for me was that I didn't really truly know where I saw myself. Um, I had invested so much time and money and sanity in <laughs> law school that, um, you know, it was those were difficult feelings to be having. And so I tried to give myself another opportunity in an entirely different area of law. I thought maybe it was the actual area that, you know, wasn't vibing with me and, and wasn't the right fit maybe. So I transitioned into personal injury focused mostly on medical malpractice with, you know, high stakes, heavy litigation cases and uh, got a ton of experience in even a 12 month period. But really that experience kind of only solidified that that wasn't what I was meant to do. So ultimately I ended up leaving the practice of law and I took some time to really focus on where my skills would translate and what I would be good at. And, you know, more importantly, what I was really interested in and what was going to make me happy. Um, and that kind of leads into my career aha moment that I had back oh, then. Good. Yeah. Share it with us. I'm sure that through that reflection and time that you you know, took to think about what made you happy and where you wanted to be, that you accomplished some pretty lofty goals or had some some successes that you want to share with us? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like to talk about this career aha moment because it really was just the kickstart to, to where I am today. And where I am today is something that I am just so eternally grateful for. Having professional happiness is, is something that I 
you know, didn't previously have and to be able to have it now, I just, um, you know, I feel really lucky. That's really the only way I can say it. Um, that aha moment was, it's all tied around to having an honest conversation with myself. I really had to ask myself some hard questions um, at that time. And this was, again, I can just pinpoint the moment in time. It was in 2017 where I had given, you know, the two different areas of law my all, and I was still just not feeling like that was meant to be and like this is the direction I wanted to go in. And so those honest conversations can be tough. I mean, you have to ask yourself, what is going to make me happy? Is, you know, what is going to fulfill me? What's going to bring me purpose? What's going to get me out of bed in the morning? Right. And, you know, no one else is going to answer these questions for you. That's the biggest thing. It's up to you to ask yourself those questions and answer truthfully and then act accordingly because you can just, you know, kind of ask yourself those things, but depending upon the answers, you are the one that has to change your situation. And that can be kind of scary mm -hmm. because, you know, then it becomes, well, what if I do this and it doesn't work out? And what if I do that and it doesn't work out? And the last thing that I wanted was to totally switch gears and, you know, learn that, that maybe that wasn't the right path. And that's right. not, um, you know, that's not a situation that I wanted to be in. So, Ultimately, what I decided to do is just leave practicing. I didn't have a job lined up, and that in and of itself was a huge risk. That's a big, uh, bold, it's a big, bold move. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's tough because it wasn't just myself that had invested all the, you know, time, money, and energy in law school. It was my husband. It was my parents. It was yeah. my family who supported me, you know, emotionally and mentally the late nights. So... Um, it was definitely an all around tough decision, but absolutely the right one. And one I'm definitely happy that I made. So what, at what point would you say, like, you just realized that you weren't happy? Like, were you just, was there a particular case or a judge or um, just a work situation where you were just like, you know what, this is just not what I want to do anymore. So I wouldn't even say that it was a specific moment or a specific okay. case or instance, because there were moments in my law career that were incredibly fulfilling and incredibly just gave me moments where I was bursting with joy because I had worked so hard to get to where I was. And when I would win a case or I would win a hearing against an attorney who had like 20 years experience on me, there's no denying those were some phenomenal moments in my career. Right. Ones that brought me a lot of purpose and a lot of fulfillment. But for me, it's the everyday. It's not like the little in-between moments of that was incredible. That was awesome. I, you know, those were more few and far between at that stage in my career. Whereas now I really feel like I wake up every day super excited to do what I do and you know, I have all of these goals and my vision is so much more clear now than it was back then. And I think that was the biggest difference that it wasn't specific, wasn't a specific moment, but more just like that everyday feeling that I had. It's like a gut instinct. Yeah. And I listened to that gut instinct. And I think that's a really important point to, to uh, acknowledge because your gut really is a great, uh, what's the word? I don't know exactly, but it's, it's, it's a great reflection of how you feel as a person. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's like your inner clock telling you what's going on. So absolutely. So tell us, what are you doing now? So fast now forward. I am, what's that? I said fast forward. Yes. Fast forward. So when I left practicing, I should probably touch on what I did at Thompson Reuters because it ultimately led me to what I'm doing okay. now. And I've been in my current company for like four months at this point. Um, but, you know, TR definitely led me into the Latera path. And when I left practicing, I took some time off and, you know, that was probably about three or four months. I did a little bit of independent contract work uh, for a private practice law firm. But for the most part, I was really just thinking about what my next move was going to be. And every single day I would either sit down and, you know, think about all of my transferable skills and everything that did bring me joy in the practice of law. And then I would research various industries because at the time I never knew, you know, this might be a little embarrassing to admit, but I didn't know legal sales and legal tech sales was an industry. Right. Um, you know, these are what I sell now are, are products that I used as an attorney, but I didn't 
it just never really occurred to me that that was an industry I could go into. And so one day I was just browsing LinkedIn and I saw an opportunity at Thomson Reuters um, for an account executive position in their small law channel. And I applied, not, not with high hopes at all, because sometimes when you apply to jobs like that, you know, black hole, <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> those LinkedIn applications. And I heard from the recruiter and I went through, you know, six rounds of interviews and got this role where, you know, they were looking for someone with, you know, six to 10 years sales experience. But in my mind, I had that because right. when I was a family law attorney and a PI attorney, if I didn't sell myself and I didn't have clients, right. you know, and I wasn't assisting partners with their initial interviews and client presentations, then there's no business. So I position it as I do have this sales experience and ultimately went to TR, uh, loved it, was there for four years, um, had a couple of different roles. Um, and then in May of 2022, I decided that I wanted to see what was next for my legal sales and, and tech career. And I transitioned over to Latera, which was the most natural transition ever. The company is incredible. I can't say enough good things, truly. It's exploding in the legal tech space and we are just so busy and you know, working with these Canadian law firms is a different aspect to TR. So I'm just really enjoying that as well. Well, so there's a couple of things that I heard you say there, and I hope the audience picked up on them. And the first and foremost is you you sat down and you looked at your skills and what made you happy, and then you looked at other careers that could possibly be a good fit. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, you applied for a job that you may not have had the skill set for, even though you thought you did. And a lot of women are afraid to do that. But So I want to give you kudos for that. So A, for figuring it out you know, how to take your skill set and, and apply it to another role, but more importantly, the fact that you applied for something that a lot of women just would never have considered doing. You know, they'd look at the job description and say, oh, you know, I don't have that, or I don't have this, or, you know, this is too scary of a, of a change in my career. So mm -hmm. I think that's a big takeaway for me. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that very much. You know, so tell us a little bit more about Latera. What do you do for them? And what are they? What do they do? What, what do they do for lawyers? Yeah. So Latera is a legal software company. And we are, I like to think of us and the company likes to think of itself. We're divided into four different lines of business. Okay. And so the products that we sell, if I was speaking to a non-attorney to explain essentially what uh, Latera does, we provide software that speaks to the practice of law as well as the business of law. So essentially, we are helping attorneys do their job. We are helping in their everyday workflow. We're helping them be more efficient, helping them be more accurate, mitigate risk, all the things that are important in the day-to-days of an attorney. And then we also sell software um, that helps the business run operationally. So we're working with various departments um, to just help everything run more smoothly, experience management tools. Um, I think that... The, the big difference between Thomson Reuters and Latera is that I'm much more on the tech side in Latera. And I find that incredibly exciting. Um, and one of the reasons I love what I do so much is because I have been in the shoes of an attorney. And I truly believe that the tools and the services that Latera sells and offers to our firms, they are changing lives. They're helping attorneys go home earlier. They are helping you get your job done faster. They are helping you bring in more business because you're spending less time on things that don't matter and more time on things that do. And so I think that's part of why I am so grateful that I had the time as a practicing attorney mm -hmm. because it helps me appreciate what I do that much more. Um, and my particular role, I work with large law firms. So I am the account executive for all of the large firms. And by large, that means, you know, 65 attorneys all the way up to a little over a thousand. Wow. Um, once you reach like an enterprise global level, um, that wouldn't be a firm that I handle, but um, I'm working with all of the large firms in the Pacific Northwest and then all across Canada. So it's so about 80 firms total. Okay. I would have to think that a lot of your success in uh, your new job is because you've sat in the seat of being an attorney and you know what it's like to bang your head against the wall on some of these things that this, this software can help alleviate. 
I like to think so. I mean, I do think that I do think that having been an attorney makes me better at what I do. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely fortunate to have sat on the other side of the table because it gives me, gives me that perspective as well. And I think perspective is an important thing. Absolutely. Okay. So during this journey, what lessons have you learned? Uh, the biggest lesson I have learned is listen to your instincts. And you kind of took the words out of my mouth um, when you said, you know, so some women would be afraid to necessarily apply for a job they didn't think they had the skills for. My biggest piece of advice and the biggest thing I've learned is do the thing you're afraid to do and do it now. I love that. And don't do what you think you're supposed to do. Yeah. And this brings me back to that law school piece and that investment in, you know, and it's not like I worked at a firm for a long time or was practicing for a long time. We're talking, you know, three, three years. And I think that it brings me back to that perspective piece too. There was no other option in my mind at the time in 2017 other than practicing law because I thought that because I had invested all of that effort, the finance, the money, the mm -hmm. mental health, all of it, you know, into this idea that I had about what my life was going to look like. The idea of not doing that for a moment, I was like, I'm abandoning everything that I've worked for. Right, right. <laughs> and so I needed to change my perspective on that. I needed to shift my focus to what I was going to do next and train myself not to look at it like I was abandoning everything I'd worked for, mm -hmm. but rather how am I redirecting myself and my path to have something better? Right. And when I had that mental mind shift, I think that it opened doors for me. And I was like, no, I'm giving myself an opportunity to truly do something I want to do. I mean, this is, we spend the most of our time at work, right? Um, <laughs> most of us, I mean, most of us do, uh, when, when we have a professional career, that's where most of your time is spent and life's too short to be spending it unhappy. So. No, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And, and I appreciate you sharing your story because, um, so many people do stay stuck in their day-to-day -day job and they think that there's no way out. And mm -hmm. um, that is obviously not the case. You know, there's, there's, when, when, uh, when you just find that you're not feeling good about, you know, what you're doing or you're not sleeping well at night, that's when you mm -hmm. really need to listen to that gut instinct as you, to your point and pivot, right? Do yeah. life is too short. Totally. Words to live by. <laughs> Words to live by. <laughs> All right. So I'm assuming in your adult life, you've learned some money tips along the way, whether those were in your career, you know, negotiating uh, a job or mm -hmm. uh, your personal finances. What, what, what has stood out for you? So I have a couple. I, I have learned these along the way and they're not things that I've always been great at. And sometimes there are things I'm more mindful of at certain times than others. Even now, you know, like sometimes there's moments where I'm like, I want to pause and uh, think about what I've learned along the way. Mm -hmm. But I think if I were to kind of narrow it down, what have I learned along the way when it comes to money is be strategic. Be strategic in the way that you live off of your income. It's important to me to, one of the biggest things for me when I was asking myself those hard questions is I wanted to be completely financially independent. Ah, love and that. <laughs> if I can find a way to make money off the money I'm making, then that's huge. And that takes strategy. That takes talking to people. You know, um, financial planning and managing money is not my expertise. Right. So I leverage resources in my life to be able to do that. And when I first started in this industry and realized how truly lucrative it could be, I had to start planning. Um, I was not willing to just wing it. Um, and so that leads me into my next tip is set financial goals. Oh, I, I, I emphasize this one because it's the same as in real life, right? If you're not setting goals, then what are you setting out to achieve? And right. I think that having a clear vision of where you want to be at certain points is super critical because if you think about you know, highly successful organizations and individuals have a very clear vision in mind of where they're going. Right. So having that same vision for your financial health and well-being, I think it works the exact same way. So goals are important. 
I, I mean, obviously, I agree 100% uh, as a financial planner and help sure, of course. To set goals. Uh, but I think, you know, you, you make a really good point, too. I mean, you do this in other aspects of your life. Why wouldn't you do it with the thing that you work so hard to earn? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do find that a lot of people like they, it money, either how they grew up with it or the relationship with it can sometimes be daunting, you know, and yeah. You know, a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck and they don't have the ability to do that. But I think that's another reason to your point earlier is like you need to push yourself. And if something's not feeling right, then it's time to move into another direction, you know, Um, whether that's your career, whether that's your money, whether that's a relationship. Absolutely. And you know what? I didn't um, I didn't have the financial freedom I do now when I was an associate attorney and even though I was in a different situation monetarily, I think that younger me and that, you know, just starting off in my career, me still could have used these same tips though, just because, you know, I was in a different paycheck situation, if you will, I still, I wasn't setting financial goals and I wasn't being strategic and I wasn't thinking about how I was spending or using the money I was earning. Um, And so I think that, I think this can speak, you know, across the board and and would be definitely something I would have told my younger self. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, I'll be the first to admit that I've made mistakes along the way too. I mean, you know, it's trial by error, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you learn learn from it. And, and so I think that's a, that's a great takeaway. So Megan, switching gears, where can we find you And, and what, uh, what can we do to support your efforts going forward? So multiple ways to find me. I'm on LinkedIn um, and I'm all very active on LinkedIn. I mean, I always have it up um, in the background. So definitely can message me on LinkedIn. I'm also on Instagram under uh, at Maggie Church. I don't really use my Instagram for um, for professional reasons. I actually have some, you know, side passion projects which was going to lead me into one last money tip I wanted to tell you. Okay, go for it. Um, And it was something that I learned relatively recently within the last year. But if you can find a way to have multiple streams of income that are based off of being able to monetize passion projects, it is really incredible. And when I say multiple streams of income, I by no means mean go out and get three jobs. Right. (laughs) So, but you know, it's something that I like recently have come into in the last year to 18 months. I'm really, really, really into fitness and it is totally separate and apart from my professional everyday job um, Mm -hmm. that I get up and do, you know, eight, 10 hours a day. But it's just something that I was thinking about as I was preparing talking to you. And I think it's worth, worth saying. Um, So yeah, LinkedIn, Instagram. um, And I mean, I'm happy to share my personal email as well. It's um, megan.church324 at gmail.com. And and really any kind of reach out is appreciated. I'm I'm really active on all of the platforms. So. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you again for your time today. I know you've been busy traveling this week and and for you to fit me in is very much appreciated. I am grateful. Uh, And again, thank you for being a part of the Women in Tech and the Money Story series. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This is honestly my privilege and an honor. I I did look at the other women you interviewed and they are all incredibly impressive, very, very brilliant women. So thank you for asking me to do this. Absolutely. It was an honor to have you and hopefully we'll see you at the next uh, reunion. Sounds great. Thanks. Right. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. Okay. Bye-bye.